Hello, my name's Mark and I am GK Tutor. I'm here today with Practical Machinist to look at ways we can check our micrometer to make sure it's reading accurately. So the first check we need to do is to check that our measuring faces of our micrometer are parallel. Now, if we have dropped our micrometer on a concrete floor, that's one of the things that may affect this. So with our mating faces, if they look frosty, it means they might not be in parallel. And a way we can check this is with a precision ball bearing, also known as a gauge ball. So these gauge balls are extremely accurate, way more accurate than we need to be able to measure with our micrometer. So what we do is we take five separate readings of our ball and we take it as we move it down the faces of those mating surfaces of our micrometer and we take five different readings and if they're the same then we know that it's all parallel. So to measure the flatness of an anvil and the spindle mating faces we use an optical parallel. So these optical parallels are glass discs and they're highly polished and kept in rings that look like this. Now they come in sets of four. So we see through the glass and we can see each mating face. Now the reason they come in sets of four allows us to rotate our spindle by 90 degrees and check our spindle in four different positions. So this gives us a visual guide on where any high spots may be on our anvil or spindle mating faces. So as we look through the glass, we see an optical illusion that gives us a pattern. And if we use a monochromic light, we can see this pattern a little bit clearer. So often we do that in the inspection room to see this. So once we look through, we might see a few patterns on that glass, and this is what those patterns mean. So if we see radial lines like this, it means that our anvil is concave or convex. It shows any high spots in a radial fashion on that mating face. And to check parallelism, we will get a surface like this, where it shows lines and we can see how parallel those faces are as it touches the glass. The next check we do is check our readings of our micrometer along a full range of distances. So we don't just check the micrometer closed at the zero position, we also need to check it at the five millimeter, the 10 millimeter, and so on. We'll more about this range in a minute. To do that, we would use gauge blocks, also known as slips, to measure our micrometer across its full travel range to make sure it's accurate at every stage. Now on the larger micrometers, we also have a setting bar that's usually supplied with the mic. Now these come in two variations, either with flat faces or curved faces, and we would use these to check at the range of our micrometer. Now the ones with the curved faces, we can use to check the same way as we did with the uh, gauge ball. So we can move it down our faces of our micrometer and measure five different positions to make sure that it's also flat. So these setting bars come with our larger micrometers that may be too large to find a gauge ball to fit our size. Five step calibration method applies to micrometers. So we can use this system to check our mics. So let's go over these five steps. Step one is to inspect the frame for any signs of damage. Now, if we find damage on that frame, it may mean that it's no longer parallel. So we would have to do some extra checks with our gauge ball to make sure it is in fact still parallel. Damage to the frame can often show that it's been dropped. So we would need to take extra precautions when checking that. Step two is to rotate the spindle and move through the whole range of movement. We would close our micrometer so it reads to the zero position then slowly unwind our micrometer until the full range of travel has been achieved. Now what we're looking for here is any binding and rubbing as we rotate that micrometer. Now if we do find any wear on that thread, we may need to send it to a technician to check that thread for us and to see if it can be repaired. Now quite often this would need to be sent away to do if we haven't got the ability to do it in house. Step three is to inspect both measuring faces. That's the faces of our anvil and our spindle. So what we're looking for here is pitted or frosted surfaces that may tell us that something is wrong there with those faces. So we need to be very strict with ourselves. If we find anything wrong at this stage, we may need to scrap the micrometer off or send it away for repair. 
And this is because if we have a thousand parts and our micrometer is reading slightly wrong, then we're gonna scrap those thousand parts all because of our measurement equipment and not because of our ability to be machinists. So we need to be very careful and very strict that if we find any damage at all, we need to think about replacing our micrometer or sending it away for repair. Now in our micrometer box, we have a spanner with our micrometer and this is used to adjust our instrument where at the zero position. So if our mic is not reading zero, we would use that spanner to adjust this until it does. And this works fine if you're using a 0 to 25 millimeter or 0 to one inch micrometer. But if we're using larger micrometers, say a 25 to 50 millimeter, we would use a gauge block at this point to get that zero position. We can trust our gauge blocks because they're way more accurate than our standard micrometers. Now step five is that we record the accuracy by testing with traceable gauge blocks. So we use gauge blocks to measure the full range of measurement on our tool and we record at each measurement so we have that traceability there so we can go back to our records and know that the micrometer was fine at this point of inspection. So when we are testing our micrometer across the range, there is normally graphs supplied with our micrometer that shows us those measuring points. Now these graphs show 11 points, but the zero position we don't have to record, but we do have to record the other 10 for traceability. Now these graphs may be different for different micrometers, but this range shows an example for a 0 to 25. So it tells us what measurements we need to take, and then we record those measurements down, again, for traceability. So that's the five-step calibration method for checking a micrometer. Now, if you want to know more about this subject and more about your measuring equipment, I do have a course over on my website uh, for measuring equipment, calibration, testing, and checking. Now there's a lot more to owning measuring equipment than just knowing how to read it. We also need to know how to look after it and how to inspect it regularly, because if our micrometer or our vernier caliper or whatever measuring instrument we are using fails and it is incorrect, we're going to scrap a lot of parts. So it's very important that we need to know how to look after our tools and this course teaches you how to do that. So pop over to G-Code Tutor where I have a range of courses on G-Code programming, CAD CAM, machine shop maths, and how to calibrate and check your measuring equipment.